We're excited to announce that we have a bill already. We have a craft and a model bill and we're putting it in front of lawmakers and regulators and asking them, hey, you should take a look at this. We are also actively working on legislation to be able to ensure that states can participate in these types of strategic reserves as well. We're very excited about strategic reserves of the states and we think we can get it done in 2025. There really just is no better asset in the world for stabilizing and establishing your purchasing value and power into the future than Bitcoin. But Bitcoin as a, as a savings technology really can't be outperformed because you're not relying on any one company or any one country's ability to to be able to thrive and survive into the future, we are going to see Bitcoin mining become one of the most important grid infrastructure tools that we have available to us. The cheapest energy comes from oftentimes renewable energy. And you're going to see a consistent growth of Bitcoin mining using more and more clean energy. I'm proud to say that the United States has the highest amount of hash rate of any country in the world. We are on the upswing, we are winning, and we are scoring points. Just because Bitcoin is outside of the physical world and it's in the digital world doesn't mean that you're not. At any time, any government could use force, maybe violence even, to come after you as a Bitcoiner. Do you want to live in a country where you feel like you have to hide and put your Bitcoin beneath your bed and hide your private keys. And maybe you don't even have to hide, can't even hide your private keys because if they find them, then they'll arrest you. Maybe you have to memorize it. Well, what if something happens to you? What if you get banged in the head? You lose all your wealth because you're so fearful that your government is going to come and they're going to take your Bitcoin from you. This is why Bitcoiners need to become extremely politically active. The United States and the people that live within the United States are the largest holders of Bitcoin in the entire world. I want to talk as a first topic about the U.S. strategic reserve of Bitcoin. Um, I think it's really interesting before we get into like how it will happen and everything like that. What do you think would be the implications if it actually happens, if, Bit if Bitcoin is actually adopted as a strategic reserve asset uh, in the U.S.? Well, I think it would have profoundly important implications for the United States and would obviously be used as a great tool in our toolbox to be able to help us combat inflation and make sure to stabilize the economy. Um, but, but really though, we, we really should take a step back and, and ask ourselves, you know, why, why do we need a strategic reserve and why would the American people you know, sort of benefit from this type of strategic reserve? And it really has to do obviously with this idea that as time goes on, The currency that we used to rely on as a currency to be able to save in is no longer viable as a form of savings. It's not a great savings technology. You know, I, I think America and Americans, even American leadership at this point, recognizes that the dollar is not a great savings tool. And this is why not only uh, co companies, countries, nation states, governments, and even individuals are finding, trying to find any way possible to be able to get into assets. And there really just is no better asset in the world for a stabilizing and establishing your purchasing val value and power into the future than Bitcoin. And so what we really want to do is we want to make sure that the countries that adopt Bitcoin, like El Salvador has, uh, that they are able to secure their purchasing power into the future. And they can do that with Bitcoin. And the number one reason why Bitcoin is so powerful as a tool for saving your value and your power into the future is because you can't debase the currency. It's impossible. Anything else out there, you can dilute and you can debase. Not just currencies, you can also do this with stocks. I mean, we see it happening right in front of us all the time. There are publicly traded companies all across this ecosystem in the Bitcoin space, outside the Bitcoin space, and nothing against it. Some of them use it, use it effectively as a tool. Uh, but, they, but they're debasing. They're debasing their, their currencies, these nation states, these companies, they're debasing and diluting their stock. And if you believe in the, the way that they're allocating that diluted shares or that diluted currency back into the ecosystem to invest it, then maybe it's a good idea. But generally, we don't see that type of behavior with governments. Governments tend to overspend um, and they tend to uh, overpay for a lot of projects. So what we can do instead of, is instead of having countries and states even in the USA rely on things like the dollar to be able to save in, we can rely on things like Bitcoin. Um, obviously, I think you know there's a great story to be told around US treasuries as well. A lot of people moving into US treasuries, but But Bitcoin as a, as a savings technology really can't be outperformed because you're not relying on any one company or any one country's ability to be able to thrive and survive into the future. Bitcoin is a finite amount of supply, 21 million. That can't be changed. And that's really important for countries and for states who are looking for a way to be able to save into the future that doesn't involve relying on other parties, other third parties, other countries, other companies to be ensured that they can have that purchasing power far, far into the future. And so at Satoshi Action, not only are we endorsing the type of legislation that Senator Lummis has put forward at the federal level, we are also actively working on legislation to be able to ensure that states can participate in these types of strategic reserves as well. 
And we're excited to announce that we have a bill already. We have a craft and a model bill and we're putting it in front of lawmakers and regulators and asking them, you know, hey, you should take a look at this. Last cycle, what we did was we said, hey, study it. But at Satoshi Action, we're always progressing forward. We always want to be on the bleeding edge of policy innovation. That's one of the exciting things about being at the state level in the US versus being at the federal level is you get 50 chances, 50 different chances to be able to say, hey, let's innovate, let's try this. In Washington, DC, it's very hard to move policy along. That's not true at the States. We're very excited about strategic reserves at the States and we think we can get it done in 2025. That's that's amazing. I would love to see that. Um, and now uh, to, to the original one, uh, what, what do you think is the implication of, of that when actually like, then uh, the, this is actually implemented and we're coming along? Uh, what kind of implications do you expect that from happening? Obviously a game theory advantage of, mm -hmm. of the United States, but is there, is there more to it? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's great for Bitcoin, right? I mean, especially when you have nation states and states themselves in the US allocating into Bitcoin, you're obviously going to see an increase in the resources and the policy around Bitcoin increase. And we might start to see policies that specifically target Bitcoin in a positive way, instead of seeing these broad ranging bills, which you know sort of mix Bitcoin and crypto all in together, which I understand why they want to do comprehensive legislation. But at the end of the day, you know, Bitcoin is very much a unique technology. It is out on its own completely. There is no other crypto technology that is going to have the societal, economic, or energy impacts that Bitcoin will, um, specifically on the Bitcoin mining front. I mean, we are going to see Bitcoin mining become one of the most important grid infrastructure tools that we have available to us ever, ever, ever. I mean, like batteries are great. Like I like batteries. A lot of Bitcoiners don't like batteries. They don't like renewable energy. I'm a big fan of renewable energy. I think that renewable energy is very affordable. I think we're going to have a Dyson sphere in the future. And that involves a lot of solar panels, a lot of windmills. You know, we're capturing uh, the energy that is already available to us and is always continuously available no matter what. You know, we're never going to run out of renewable energy. And so in my opinion, I think it's really important to make sure that our country can benefit from the opportunities that Bitcoin mining can provide. And Bitcoin mining is this extremely powerful technology for monetizing excess energy for balancing the grid, for enhancing renewables. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like the perfect tool for renewable energy companies because whenever you build a renewable energy facility, whether that be wind and solar, and we're talking about variable renewable energy here, of course, not hydro, but whenever you build wind and solar plants, you need to have someone who's gonna buy that energy because it's gonna be made or wasted either way. It's not like a gas plant where you can turn it on and off and like save your fuel and that's sort of like a cost savings, cost avoidance. Wind and solar, create excess energy all the time that goes to waste. And Bitcoin mining is this extremely valuable grid balancing technology and, and, and renewable energy enhancing technology that can come in and buy up every single amount of waste and energy that wind and solar provide. And that is, you know, an industry term in the wind and solar space is called curtailed energy. So anytime you see excess energy from wind and solar get generated or doesn't get generated because it doesn't have a buyer, and it gets wasted, they call that curtailed energy. And, it, and it's wild. Like the, the amount of curtailed energy that's going on across this planet is insane. So like, let's say California alone, California, they have a grid operator there called Kaiso, California's uh, independent system operator. And they actually track the amount of curtailment that takes place from wind and solar in the state. They are currently on track to curtail more energy by 2030 than the bottom 36 nations combined. And that's just one state. It's one place on the planet. When we have wind and solar generation being built all across the world has this same exact problem. I was actually speaking to some renewable energy generators in another country recently, and they curtail as much as 30% of their energy. I mean, it's an incredible amount of curtailment, incredible amount of waste. And so things like a Bitcoin strategic reserve, I think are really valuable because I think at the end of the day, once governments really start to hold Bitcoin, they're going to care a lot more about other types of Bitcoin policies, including how we can unlock Bitcoin mining in this country as a technology to enhance our energy systems. I, I love that a lot. Um, do you think that America will be the first major country to actually like embrace Bitcoin in, in, in a good way? Obviously, El Salvador, there's Putin, there are small countries, but like America, that would be a major country. I also think about maybe Germany, probably not, uh, but Germany would be a major country, Argentina, Brazil, one of, one of those. So, I mean, it's let's 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 be clear here that the united states and the people that live within the united states are the largest holders of bitcoin in the entire world there are more americans that hold bitcoin in large amounts than any other place in the entire planet the united states itself is one of the largest holders of bitcoin in the entire world already obviously that's through confiscation but they still hold quite a bit of bitcoin hopefully we can convert that type of bitcoin that they hold into a strategic reserve but at the end of the day i mean the us is already far out and ahead on bitcoin now we could always be doing much much better i mean we're 
we're fighting battles still left and right. Uh, there's going to be a big fight in Texas where the lieutenant governor is coming out strongly against Bitcoin mining. There's going to be a huge amount of work that's going to have to go into combating that pushback on Bitcoin mining. But lawmakers are already starting to care. And lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are starting to care. And we see, not only do we see Republicans who are way, of course, way out ahead on this issue right now, but we see a lot of Democrats coming around as well. And there's going to be a lot of exciting news in 2025. And even before then, there's going to be some news that you'll, you'll see that I know that's coming around the corner where it makes it more apparent that this is a bipartisan technology that unifies across party lines. Now, there will be differences. You know, Democrats will want to enhance clean energy with Bitcoin mining and reduce the usage of Bitcoin mining around coal plants. And uh, Republicans are going to want to see all the above. They're going to want to see Bitcoin mining, use coal plants, use gas plants, use renewable energy. And um, those are the fights that I'm looking forward to because those are the real substantive fights not whether we should or shouldn't do Bitcoin. That's where we are right now. We need to get away from whether or not we should or shouldn't do Bitcoin and start migrating to an environment where we talk about how we're going to do Bitcoin. And that migration you see uh, happening within like a, a year or something like that. So right now it's still like- oh, it's happening right now. Bitcoin. Yeah, it's happening right now. Ah, I love that. Really cool. Um, within the United States, there's all like uh, states uh, on the states level. Uh, I've, I thought about maybe it's interesting to think about the different states as they're really big also. Um, what do you see as like the most friendly and the most um, most friendly to Bitcoin states? Obviously, I think about Texas the first. Uh, is, is that like the, the main one for you? I think Texas has a lot of people that care deeply about Bitcoin. There's definitely some lawmakers that care about Bitcoin there and Bitcoin mining, but it's also going to face an incredible backlash here in the near term for political reasons, in, in my opinion. And there's going to be a big push to limit the ability for Bitcoin mining to participate in grid balancing programs. That is not because Bitcoin mining is not good at balancing the grid. In fact, it's because Bitcoin mining is so good at balancing the grid that the competitors in Texas don't want to see it continue to succeed. And so they're using the long arm of the government there to limit the access for Bitcoin mining to that grid system. Uh, but I, I hearken back to the words of the late Brad Jones, who you know co-authored a paper about Bitcoin mining's impact on the grid. And in that paper, we both clearly outlined the benefits of Bitcoin mining, not only for the Texas grid, but also for energy systems writ large. So in my opinion, there will be this big fight in Texas. I think it will ultimately not go as bad as it could, uh, but there's going to be some body damage done for sure. Now, across the country, there are states looking to embrace Bitcoin at increasing rates. We see states like Montana and states like Oklahoma, as well as Louisiana, doing a lot to be able to embrace this technology. I would put Georgia in that list too. A lot of great Bitcoin mining stuff going on in Georgia. Uh, CleanSpark doing some great work out there. And you know we see it expanding into other states as well. It's, it's really going to be a constant game of you know two steps forward, one step back. I mean, that's really the way the policy game works. We have to remember that we don't live in a vacuum. There are competitors who want to use the energy that Bitcoin mining wants to use. And Bitcoin mining is by far and away the best benefit of Bitcoin um, as far as like a, from a feature perspective that Americans will be able to experience. Because ultimately, we even though the dollar is not the best savings technology for the long term, it is still way more stable in the short term compared to other currencies across the planet. So in my opinion, you're going to see a lot of these less stable currencies, countries where they don't have stable fiat currencies, they're going to adopt Bitcoin faster or countries where they don't have their own currency. And El Salvador is an exact example of that. They're using the US dollar, of course. I think those are going to be the countries where you're going to see more of a monetary uh, payment system story be told. And then in countries that are huge energy rich nations, like the United States, like Russia, like China, like India, other countries as well, you're going to see this mass adoption. You can put the Middle East in there. There's some parts of the Middle East I would certainly put in there. You're going to see mass adoption of Bitcoin mining. And so, but as that adoption takes place, you're going to say, see these two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward on grid balancing, enhancing renewables. And then what's going to happen is competitors in that space, whether they be generators, whether they be the battery companies are going to say, hey, well, we don't really necessarily like all this Bitcoin mining coming in here and eating up our lunch, eating our revenues up. Let's push back on them the only way that we can. We can't beat them in the free market. So we're going to use government to do that. And that's happening right now in Texas. And it's definitely going to happen across the world as Bitcoin mining continues to prove to be one of the most important grid balancing technologies and energy enhancing technologies that we have available to us. Uh, that, that's I never thought about batteries being a competitor with Bitcoin mining, but it's it's very logical actually. Uh, that, that's a fascinating. <laughs> never thought about it that way. In my, I mean, listen. In my opinion, I think battery companies and Bitcoin mining can collaborate, but but they're not there yet. They don't see it that way. 
they are going to see that anytime a, B- a Bitcoin mine is balancing the grid through ancillary services like grip, b- demand response, frequency response, or voltage regulation, they are going to see that as a new competitor in the ecosystem. And that's unfortunate because really Bitcoin mining companies and battery companies should be like owning each, o- each other or doing joint ventures together or uh, doing mergers and acquisitions. But we don't see that right now. We just see competition. And there's going to be, I think, a lot of pushback Right now, a lot of the pushback is coming from the generators, in my opinion, uh, but there could be some pushback from those battery companies as well going into the future because they serve a lot of the same needs. They serve a lot of those grid balancing needs. Now, batteries can do something that no other technology can, which is they can store actual real energy and and deploy that energy at a different time in the day. Now, Bitcoin miners can only shave off their load and then allow the energy to be used by a different load, but they cannot hold the load and then release it at a later time. So batteries will always have that as a competitive advantage in a space and Bitcoin will never be able to take that away from the battery ecosystem. Do you see in the United States, the environment argument against Bitcoin still, or is that kind of slowly dying off? It's definitely dying off. It's definitely on its way down. Now, like I said, two steps forward, one step back, we will see a lot of progress, I think in the next year to two years, but there's a possibility that we, you know, make steps backwards at times. Um, there has been so much good work that has come out. I'm proud to say that we at Satoshi Action have released a body of peer reviewed research papers. Uh, and one in particular was in a top 2% journal. So high impact journal ones that actually really make a big difference. And we're just getting started with our research. And so there are others in the space too, though, there are other companies, other groups, other nonprofits, other universities that are working to advance research, particularly peer-reviewed research in this space. I think that's critical for combating some of this FUD, some of this really what I would call misinformation around Bitcoin mining. Yes, B- Bitcoin mining can be used to mine off of a coal plant. That's true. Bitcoin mining could be used to cause grid problems, but that's not what people are trying to do today. Today, people are trying to balance the grid. They're trying to be a participant in the grid, and they're trying to mine off some of the cleanest energy they possibly can. And the reason why is because at times, it's, it's not even just because they have a mission to do good to the environment. They also want the cheapest energy, and the cheapest energy comes from oftentimes renewable energy. And so you're going to see a consistent growth of Bitcoin mining using more and more clean energy, um, loving the growth of nuclear right now. We're seeing an explosion of nuclear because of the AI demands. Uh, that I consider nuclear also to be a form of clean energy. And I think that that argument is going to be made more and more and more, not just by us, but it's also going to be made by those at Google and Amazon, right? Who have all these resources to dump into uh, purchasing and acquiring and developing those those uh, nuclear facilities. But ultimately, there will be consistent misinformation around Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. It's never going to go away, but we are on the upswing. We are winning and we are scoring points. And I think we're going to continue to do that as time goes on. And we're going to start converting more of those people who were skeptics to be believers. As, as this, we are right now recording, I think like two, three weeks out of the election. Uh, and mm. this will probably be uh, published probably one week or one and a half weeks before the election. Um, we kind of have to touch on this a little bit. Um, even though it's almost a too big of a topic <laughs> for, for, for my uh, senses as the, the, bit, uh, the elections. Um, what do you expect whether Trump or Harris uh, will become the next president of the United States? Do, has, has this any impact in a major way on what you are doing uh, with the Satoshi Action Fund, with, with everything that you are doing and involved and what you expect also in 2025? How much of an impact has the question of who of those two people will be president? It, so there's clearly going to be big impacts. I think either way Bitcoin goes up uh, in a Trump administration, you're going to probably see the removal of Gary Gensler. That might also happen in a in a Harris administration as well, but more forcefully, more likely in a, in a Trump administration. And you're probably going to see a little less concern from the federal government around the energy consumption, and the energy usage of Bitcoin mining. But regardless of who wins, you know, Trump or Harris, pretty much everybody, I mean, because it's divided, right? you got a lot of people saying it could go either way. Obviously, poly markets, it's way out pushing for, for Trump. In my opinion, I think poly market is a little bit skewed. I, I'm not saying they're wrong. I just think that poly market is made up of probably predominantly men, young men, uh, because young men are, have a much higher propensity to gamble um, and to be into the crypto space. And so they're much more likely to believe that Trump is going to win. I mean, it's obvious. We look at the demographics. I mean, even the Harris campaign has admitted that they have a problem with young men right now. 
So I would say that poly market is way skewed. Again, they could be correct directionally, but I think it's it's a little sort of out of pocket. I think to predict that that what is it like sixty? It's a like sixty forty right now. I think that Trump is likelihood of winning. Uh, but at the polls, it's a dead match. It's a dead even uh, all across the country. So. But the one thing that's not dead even, the one thing that's pretty well agreed upon on both sides of the aisle is that there's going to be a gridlock in Congress. You're going to likely see the Senate flip to Republicans, and you're going to likely see the House flip to Democrats, which means that when Congress is divided, you're probably not going to see any activity take place. And if, you, and if it does take place, it's going to be around things that there's a broad consensus, maybe stable coins at best. And that's, I think, being hopeful. Uh, but definitely, we're not going to see any comprehensive Bitcoin or crypto language pass through the House and the Senate and get signed by the president, it's very unlikely. Uh, and that means that state work, the work that we're doing at Satoshi Action is so much more important than ever before because we can continue to drive forward Bitcoin policy, innovative Bitcoin policies that advance renewable energy, that advance Bitcoin mining, that advance uh, balancing the grid, that help to bank the unbanked, that help states to be able to acquire Bitcoin. These are all things that we are working on at Satoshi Action. These are all things that we can get across the finish line in 2025 and beyond. These are not things that are probably going to happen in, in D.C. Now, you know, I, I uh, thoughts and prayers to my, my friends in Washington, D.C., who are going to have to suffer through the next two, maybe four years of gridlock. But, uh, you know, keep up the fight because once we get a lot of these wins at the state level, the states are going to lead. And I've said this before, the states will lead. They have led. They'll continue to lead. And then ultimately, Washington, D.C. will follow the actions of those states. And this is not something new to Bitcoin. This is something that's been around for a long time. This is a strategy that's been around for decades, really. You can see it through the cannabis industry, how effectively they use the strategy. Go state by state by state, get so many states on your side, you basically force the hand of Washington, D.C. And that's what's happening right now in the cannabis industry. That's what ha what's, That is what's going to happen in the Bitcoin industry. We're already well on our way with four states having passed pro-Bitcoin legislation, including protections for self-custody, protections for node running, protections for Bitcoin mining, for protections for peer-to-peer -peer transactions. These are all things that are happening at the state level. And I believe ultimately, once we pass through this gridlock, we will see these things pass into law in Washington, D.C. What can the average Bitcoiner who is watching that uh, to do influence on a state level, uh, on a, a United States, uh, a little bit higher level, uh, to influence law and, and governments into making bit, making the United States a little bit Bitcoin friendlier? I mean, the best thing you can do to make the U.S. more Bitcoin friendly is just continue to educate. You know, and if you don't, if you're not in a position to educate your lawmaker or your regulator or those folks that are working in the government that have the position to make decisions on these technologies, you know, talk to groups that can. You know, I mean, I, I'm a, we're a big resource. We talk to state lawmakers and regulators and federal folks as well, uh, all the time, regularly. So we're very attuned to uh, the education process. We've spoke to Republicans and Democrats, both sides of the aisle, everybody in between as well, and we've been able to pitch a compelling story around Bitcoin. Uh, because the things that we say about Bitcoin are true. Bitcoin can be used as a powerful technology to balance the grid. These are things that lawmakers know that they want. They know they need to, to have a technology that can balance the grid. They know they need a technology that can help to provide emergency backup reserve power when, when there's a winter storm. I mean, we just look at Texas. Texas, they had two winter storms back to back that took the grid to its knees. The first one was winter storm Uri. Bitcoin mining didn't exist really in prevalence in the state. Uh, the, the grid was brought to its knees. They had 700 people die. It was a total catastrophe. Turn around the very next year, the very next winter, and you have Winter Storm Elliot. Same kind of storm, but the difference this time was the Texas grid was much more prepared. They had multiple new tools in their toolbox, including Bitcoin mining. The reason why they had more Bitcoin mining is because China banned Bitcoin mining. They had, didn't understand the technology. They didn't understand the value of it. They banned it. All the miners came to America. They, a lot of them plugged into Texas, started to plug into the grid balancing programs that ERCOT had in place for many years. And uh, when that winter storm hit, when winter storm Elliott hit, they shut off their power in the middle of an emergency when everyone else is trying to turn up their heat, trying to keep their homes warm, trying to keep the hospitals running. The Bitcoin miner shut down and returned roughly 1.7 gigawatts of power back to that grid. Now, 1.7 gigawatts, to put that in context, it's an incredible amount of power. It's non it's non trivial. It, uh, it is enough power to heat 1.7 million small homes. It's enough power to energize 320 large hospitals. So right in the middle of this emergency, Bitcoin mining is there providing that service, and that is a service that state lawmakers, regulators, federal elected officials across the world, in America, they all know that they need these types of technologies, and Bitcoin mining is proving that it can be one of the best 
at balancing the grid and making sure that we have emergency reserve backup systems. So if you want, again, these are the compelling stories we talk to lawmakers about. If you want to see your lawmaker, your regulator in your country, your state be pro Bitcoin, you need to tell them compelling stories about what Bitcoin can do that is important to them, not important to you. I mean, that's fine if you want to tell them why you were trying. And I will say it is helpful to tell lawmakers why you were drawn to the technology. What is it about Bitcoin that you love? But sometimes you don't have enough time to talk about what you love and you only have enough time to talk about what they might love about Bitcoin. And lawmakers across this country care about the grid. It's a big issue right now. They're looking for new ways. They're looking for innovative solutions. They also care about stabilizing the economy and providing other tools in the toolbox to be able to combat inflation and reserve the purchasing power of states in the US and the country. Um, they also wanna see rural jobs be created and Bitcoin mining creates plenty of rural jobs. Now it's not a mega job creator, but at the end of the day, a hundred jobs in a city of 1000 or a town of 1000, that's a huge amount of jobs for that, what probably was a dying city or dying town. So these are things, again, these are compelling stories that Bitcoin can do, will do, and lawmakers will react to them in a positive way if you can present them in that way. You know, stay away from ideology, stay away from Bitcoin versus crypto. It really doesn't matter when you're talking about what Bitcoin can do, because only Bitcoin really at scale can do any of these things. Sure, there's, there's, there's others out there that have copied the code. They look similar in design, but they don't have the liquidity. They're not worth $1.3 trillion. They're not going to be trusted. They don't, have the, they don't have the track record. They don't have the level of decentralization that Bitcoin has. So you don't really need to worry about Bitcoin versus crypto when you're talking about what Bitcoin can do. and you know, of course, it's fine if you have a lawmaker who asks. We do. We sometimes do. And we have more of this happening, which is exciting. More lawmakers are saying, well, I think Bitcoin is a little different than crypto. That, I heard that recently from a Democrat. I was very excited. And so um, they're starting to pay attention and things are starting to change. And that's because groups like Satoshi Action, but of course, other groups as well are out there educating lawmakers and regulators. Um, to date, we've, over, we've over-educated, I think, educated and engaged at least at least 2,000 lawmakers. So it's an incredible amount of lawmakers. That includes all 535 members of Congress who we hand-delivered Bitcoin books to. We hand-delivered multiple Bitcoin books to every single member of Congress. Yes, our calves were very sore at the end of the day. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much <laughs> yeah that's, I, I i can imagine yeah um 
how big of an impact is it when a potential presidential candidate as Trump comes out and goes to Bitcoin conferences and says like, oh, we have to mine all the Bitcoin in, in America, which is absurd, but uh, I think it sends an interesting signal. Um, what, 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 what impact does that do f for the law? Is, is that making things easier uh, immediately or is it more like, oh yeah, he talks about it, maybe it will be in the long term better than if he gets elected? So yeah, I mean, listen, we're never going to mine all the Bitcoin Bitcoin in the United States. I love it. I love it in sentiment, right? You know, I love the the, the sort of like the ethos of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, that would be a bad idea. Uh, you don't want to mine all the Bitcoin in one place. It could cause centralization issues. Now, I think the Bitcoin network will do just fine and we'll find a way to navigate around those sorts of obstacles. We've navigated around many other, many worse obstacles than that. Um, but certainly you don't want to see all the Bitcoin mining taking place here in the USA. I'm, I'm proud to say that the United States is, is the highest has the highest amount of hash rate of any country in the world, that is, I think, fine. But it, you really don't want to see 100% you know, mined in the United States. But uh, I think that these types of things bode well for the technology. You know, it's, it, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, you do, want to see, you do want to see the leaders in these parties. You want to see them advocating for Bitcoin. That's a really good sign. It shows that not only do we have value to add from a technology perspective, from an economic perspective, but clearly it's a powerful winning voting issue, which is what you want. You want your issue to be a winning issue. You don't want to be a losing issue. We were a losing issue for a while, I think, in my opinion. Um, I don't think enough people embraced Bitcoin at the rates that we have today. You know, If you go back eight years ago, there wasn't enough supporters. There wasn't enough money. There wasn't enough people lobbying or spending money in the political space or voting. And so there really wasn't, it wasn't a winning issue for them to be able to embrace Bitcoin back you know, eight years ago or even all the way back to Bitcoin's uh, foundation in 2009. But now there is. There's there's millions of Americans who are holding Bitcoin. Some people say as many as 50 million people hold some type of crypto, which I think is important. Um, you know, we have of course sort of Bitcoin versus crypto. I think it really doesn't matter exactly as quite as much when you're counting votes because all 50 million of those people, a vast majority of them at least, I believe, care positively about Bitcoin. I don't. I very rarely meet crypto people that don't like Bitcoin. They might like something else more, but they generally like Bitcoin. So you have like 50 million people, roughly, maybe maybe a little less than that, that care about this technology. They're going to vote about the technology. They're going to show up to the polls. They're going to show up to rallies. They're going to, they're going to donate. I mean, we've seen the more donations come from the crypto industry and the Bitcoin industry than any time in our history, talking exclusively about Bitcoin and then going, be, going outside of Bitcoin. It is actually an astonishing number because you have roughly uh, 50% of all super PAC money, which listen, I'm not some big super PAC you know, Stan, I'm not a, I'm not a big supporter of this type of big money in politics, but regardless, I think it's an important metric. Uh, you've got 50% of all super PAC money coming from crypto. That's what's wild. I mean, like, and, and here's the more, here's the more insane number. If you go back 10 years, we're number two from just one cycle, from just this cycle, from just this election cycle, more or less, if you go back 10 years, because we weren't really spending any money. Now we're spending a ton of money in this election cycle. We are out competing the oil and gas industry. We're out competing the renewable industry. The only people we're not beating is the Koch brothers. And that's not going to last long. I mean, you get one more cycle and it's over. We'll be the number one political spenders in, in, an, in a decade, probably even going back further than that. And that's because not only are the people in this space extremely entrenched from a moral and ethical perspective, but they're also highly entrenched from a monetary perspective. Their entire net worth might be in Bitcoin. I know to can tell you a large percentage of my net worth is in Bitcoin. Um, and there's people in the crypto space who are 100% into Bitcoin and or another technology. So if someone shows up and says, hey, I'm going to advance your, your cause, you're going to be really excited about that because you're probably not only holding the Bitcoin because you think it's going to go up, you're probably holding Bitcoin also because you think it's a fix to a lot of the world's problems. So you're highly motivated to donate to that candidate and you're highly motivated to vote for that candidate as well. So um, I'll stop there. That was a lot. But at the end of the day, I, you know, I'm, I'm very bullish on the direction of where Bitcoin is going to go in the United States. And it all stems from people who are willing to stand up and educate lawmakers and regulators and talk to their family members that are elected physicians to be able to get them to understand why we should be pro-Bitcoin. I want to take one small step backwards. I think... Um... 
uh, a lot of Bitcoiners that I meet uh, and I myself, I was in politics actually before Bitcoin and then I came into Bitcoin. I went a little bit outside of Austrian politics and now I'm getting uh, more excited about it again. Uh, I think a lot of Bitcoiners are maybe not this year, but usually uh, trying to like stay out of politics. To, Politics, they're like, oh, politics can do whatever they, they want and, and I have my Bitcoin. Um, I thought like that also last year. I, I'm changing my stance a lot on, on this matter. Um, why is it so important for us Bitcoiners to even get uh, entrenched in, in those to talks, get uh, talking with politics, push for good Bitcoin laws? Why, why is that uh, good when we as Bitcoin say, oh, Bitcoin game theory will play out, Bitcoin in the mm. really is, is there. Why, why should we get talking with politics? It's a great question. It's one that I get all the time. I think it's important to go back to uh, the beginning of my Bitcoin journey with regards to politics. I was in the same boat as everyone else. Bitcoin's outside of government, get Bitcoin's outside of politics. And this is coming from someone who spent a lot of time, you know, involved in the, the political space and also monitoring quite heavily growing up in a very uh, politically engaged family, you know, but I cut thought for some time, Bitcoin's outside this. But then one of the things that dawned on me as I was, you know, experiencing the shutdowns like everybody else was like, you know, you could have your Bitcoin and that's great, but just because Bitcoin is outside of the physical world and it's in the digital world doesn't mean that you're not. And at any time, any government could use force, maybe violence even, to come after you as a Bitcoiner. And so you have to ask yourself, do you want to live in a world, do you want to live in a country where you feel like you have to hide and put your Bitcoin beneath your, your bed and hide your private keys and Maybe you don't even have to hide, can't even hide your private keys because if they find them, then they'll arrest you. Maybe you have to memorize it. Well, what if something happens to you? What if you get banged in the head? You lose all your wealth because you're so fearful that your government is going to come and they're going to take your Bitcoin from you. That is not a world that I want to live in. I don't think that's a world that anybody wants to live in. And so if you don't want to live in that world, if you want to live in a world where governments embrace Bitcoin, they embrace the technology like El Salvador, and they advance the technology and protect Bitcoiners, and they protect the usage of Bitcoin, then you should want to see Bitcoiners like myself and others get highly politically engaged and start pushing for Bitcoin rights, protections of the right to self-custody, the right to mine, the right to use a node, the right to peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Of course, these are things that should naturally be protected, but unfortunately, we need to be able to regulate and create rules around what the government can do because if we don't, they will. They will come take your Bitcoin. They will tax your Bitcoin. They will tax your Bitcoin mining revenue to death. They will, because at the end of the day, you know, they're going to see that as a soft target. So we need to create protections for this technology as quickly as we can and as sustainably as we can to ensure that we can live and know that we live in a country that embraces the technology. And we don't have to worry about choosing between hiding underneath of the shadows or fleeing to another country. Sure. You want to flee? Do you want to uproot your entire family and flee? I mean, you're, you're 26. I'm 36. I have a family. I have a house. My mother-in-law lives with me. Like we, my kid just got starting to get good grades in school. Their things are going well. Why would I want to flee this country just so I can hold my Bitcoin? Maybe some people would choose not to hold their Bitcoin because they don't want to have to flee the country. Also don't want that outcome. So this is why Bitcoiners need to become extremely politically active. I'll go back to uh, a couple of quotes. I have really these really great quotes out there around why you should be politically engaged. And I'll paraphrase them, of course. But one is, you might not like politics. You might not even be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Government is interested in you. And so it's up to you as an individual to stand up and, and get involved and get engaged. Because, and here's the second quote, if you decide to relinquish your responsibility to be politically engaged and to be involved with the government, you will be ruled by people who don't like you and people who are in, probably inferior to you. So do you want to see a world where those types of people over, over have power over you? I don't. I want to see Bitcoiners who are thoughtful, who are caring, who think about thought, who think far into the future, who care about incentives and who care about society to be the ones making the rules. I don't want the rules to be set by people who don't like Bitcoin. I want the rules to be set by people who do. I, I love that a lot. Uh, that's what also changed my stance this year, especially also with the Bitcoin podcast that I have on the influence of the guests, because uh, you like Bit government cannot destroy Bitcoin, but the government can make your life really miserable with Bitcoin. And I think that's a, a really good uh, takeaway for here. 
And one more thing there too. You're right. Absolutely. Uh, if people don't like the idea of being politically active, they don't like the idea of bills being passed. Well, they must really hate the U.S. Constitution, which protects all of our rights in, the, in America. I mean, I, I, would, I just think it's crazy. You have these people that run around and they say, screw the government, get rid of the government. And they, they raise their hand and say, I love the U.S. Constitution. It's a great document. It, you cannot have it both ways. You cannot have a world without rules and also sort of simultaneously like the U.S. Constitution because it is a set of rules, really, that is a framework for preventing government overreach and giving us our rights, our right, freedom of speech. Super important, especially when it pertains to Bitcoin. That that is a rule, and really, ru regulations are are just rules. And so, people that say they're anti-regulation, I'm like, well, do you like do you like rules that protect you from government overreach? Probably. So there are good rules, there are bad rules. There are good regulations, there are bad regulations. I like regulations which give me freedom. Um, I think other Bitcoiners will as well. I mean, if it comes down to that level, I think like the Bitcoin white paper is a rule. <laughs> the, the Bitcoin system is a rule. You'll love my, t you'll love my talk in Switzerland then. <laughs> you will be in Lugano? Come see me in Lugano. I'm going to talk all about that. Uh, really, really cool. Um, let's talk about, a little bit about your journey in making that happen, making uh, Bitcoin laws basically. What are some big of the what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced so far in the last uh, what two two three years that you're doing that now? Two and a half years. Yep, we're going on our third year. We're almost there. It'll be our third cycle. So states operate a little differently than the federal government. Most states, about ninety five percent of them, they have short sessions, which means they last from about January to maybe March, April, May. They're different lengths. So. It, it's sort of like a, it's like a, it's a mad dash, right? So one of the biggest problems that we face when we hit January is we're, we have so much going on that we sort of can't handle it all. I mean, there's so many opportunities for us to be able to pass pro Bitcoin bills into law. And it really comes down to our ability to just be active and be in those states. And the time, the places where we can be active, the places where we can show up and actually talk directly to lawmakers, not just rely on lobbyists. Lobbyists are great. But nobody can tell the compelling message of Bitcoin better than our own team can, better than I can, better than our policy director can, or better than our director of development can. So, um, and then I would also include in there our, uh, our head of science, uh, Dr. Rudd, as well. So it, it, it really benefits us when we have the resources to be able to fly ourselves into the States, to be able to spend time there. Um, obviously, that's time spent away from family, that's time spent on the road, but it is very much worth it because we're able to secure these huge wins for Bitcoin. But every time you go, if you go look at any state we've passed a law in, we spent a lot of time in that state and or we worked directly with really great groups. There's really great groups on the ground. And a lot of these states you got the Frontier Institute in Montana. You've got the Bi Oklahoma Bitcoin Association in Oklahoma. And you've also got the Idaho Freedom Foundation in Idaho. Um, you've got the Beacon Center in Tennessee. You've got a lot of these really great, what I call center right think tanks in those states. There's, of course, center left think tanks in other states as well. But they have embraced Bitcoin in a great way. And that's resulted in very positive outcomes because it, like I said, if you support Bitcoin and you care about Bitcoin a lot and you go like myself or you go like my team and you advocate for Bitcoin, the message that you're going to sell to those lawmakers is going to be much more compelling. The message that a lobbyist tells, they, they, listen, we've had great lobbyists before that have helped us, they, they, but they're hired guns, right? They're, they're just there to help you know, get your bill passed. Um, but they don't have a tr as big of an incentive. In fact, sometimes lobbyists have an incentive to not get things done because then you can keep paying them you know, for cycle after cycle. I, I don't think we work with lobbyists like that. We have great lobbyists that work hard to get things done. But s there is a small incentive to say, why, why pass it this year? Why not work together again next year? And we can keep, keep things going. For us, to be honest, we will always keep coming back because we have new ideas, new cutting edge, innovative policy solutions. But my point is that when you have these groups which have adopted Bitcoin and embraced Bitcoin, they are like super powered lobbyists. They're, they're basically an extension of the Bitcoin ecosystem and they can tell the compelling story as well. So a big thing for us at Satoshi Action, and if you're a group listening, you know, please reach out. If you're a politically active group, especially at a state level, and you care a lot about Bitcoin and you're going to make it a part of your mission to get it across the finish line, you should reach out to us because we can help you get these things done. Uh, we can help you pass Bitcoin rights into law in your state. Um, a lot of groups are reaching out. We've had a lot of great collaboration between some of these groups and we're looking to expand. But at the end of the day, the biggest constraint for us, going back to your first point, um, is that we just need more resources. We need more resources because we have too much work and we can't get it all done ourselves. I, I, I love that a lot. Uh, really cool. I think we, we should get involved in, in politics. We should get involved with, with uh, 
it, it, it comes down to like uh, you, you should get involved in developing your neighborhood and from the neighborhood gets the district yes. and state level, uh, county level right. and all that thing. So I think that's that's something that uh, Bitcoin is actually also really big on and, and uh, I love that aspect of it. Really cool. Um, one last question before we come to the end routine of our podcast is when uh, this strategic reserve asset Bitcoin is actually adopted with, uh, with, with the states, um, could that kind of strengthen and maybe even uh, um, survive or like rescue the US dollar? Is, is that something that you're looking at uh, when, when uh, Bitcoin will be then backed or US dollar will be backed by, by Bitcoin? That's a great. I, I love this. This is this mental exercise of looking into the future on where Bitcoin and the US dollar collide. In my opinion, I believe that Bitcoin and the US dollar will exist into the future together simultaneously for some time. I think that a lot of governments and a lot of currencies around the world will convert to either Bitcoin or the dollar and maybe maybe both. Um, the reason being is because the dollar is very stable in the short term. It allows individuals that are experiencing massive inflation to actually have a, a currency they can rely on and depend on. I, and I actually believe also that stable coins will be the pathway for the broad world to be able to get access to the US dollar. Um, that's already happening. Uh, companies like Tether, companies like Circle are clearly the dominant two in that ecosystem, and they're going to continue to be for some time. I mean, Tether's already holds like more US treasuries than many, many, many nations combined. So it, that is going to be how the dollar expands. And I think that's how the dollar maintains a lot of its stability. You know, you need growth in users is really valuable. And the US dollar already has a lot of access to the global markets. I think that stable coins will just help the US dollar penetrate a little bit deeper into the hands of the individual. Now, at the same time, I think Bitcoin will also, and I think people call this a bar, a bar barrel theory or something like that, where it's like both ends are you know sort of heavy in the middle, everything gets destroyed um, or is flat. And um, I think that Bitcoin will be the prominent long-term savings technology that people will use. I also think that uh, my theory around the impact of Bitcoin directly on the dollar, like here and at home, is that Bitcoin will become, especially once stable, and it's not stable yet, but in the next 10, 15 years, we're going to see a lot more stability out of Bitcoin. And when it's a lot more stable, it will be a very, very accurate measuring device for how much monetary debasement is taking place because it will react almost instantaneously to that type of debasement. It has in the past. I think that will actually increase once it becomes more stable. That will become more prevalent and more obvious because there will only be that one major activity of monetary debasement that really sort of sets it off. Um, that will result in lawmakers going, oh man, look at that. We, we can't keep doing this or people are going to leave to Bitcoin where when, when cause they're going to know that we're going to keep debasing the currency. And so I view Bitcoin as sort of like a, a mirror, um, a reflection device, a response to debasement um, that will take place and it will be more prevalent in the future. And so it will act as more of like a check and balance against runaway monetary debasement. I don't think we're ever going to, in my lifetime, be rid of flexible currencies. I think Bitcoin will make flexible currencies more responsible. That, that acts as well. Uh, it, it's the same as like when, when Twitter knows Nostris here, Twitter might be <laughs> better to create this than, than that. Yeah, really, really cool. It's, it seems like that uh, US dollar, Euro and BRICS is like, the, it will come down to like the, those, those, those three big ones, even though mm. we have so many currencies right now, uh, but with stable coins uh, and, and all those things, uh, it, it, it doesn't I, I think we, we don't need that many currency at all. It's like there will be three, four big no. ones. No, the US dollar is like 90% of the global market. So I don't I don't think the US dollar is going anywhere anytime soon. I think people like to pretend and there's efforts underway all the time to subvert the US dollar and have bricks or have something else or the yen come through. I just don't really believe this idea that the world is going to trust China with their monetary policy and the way that they treat their currency. I don't think they're going to trust that more than the American system. I could be wrong, but that's my, that's, you know, I stand on that. Really cool. Perfect. Then we, let's come to the end routine. I switched the end routine up today a little bit. Uh, uh, so I want to try a new uh, form of it. Um, what advice do you generally have for the average Bitcoiner? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, my advice is if you're new to Bitcoin, 
uh, learn about Bitcoin as quietly as you possibly can because your opinions of Bitcoin will radically change over the next four years. When I found Bitcoin in 2017, I had many opinions and many thoughts. Uh, ultimately, many of them were destroyed or proven to be incorrect. Uh, and it's always best to learn, uh, learn and make mistakes quietly. Uh, my second one would be, uh, I would say, do everything you can to to educate those around you. I mean, listen, don't be the annoying one at the, you know, the, the kitchen table when no one wants to hear about it, but be, but just arm yourself with enough information or arm yourself with enough resources from organizations like Satoshi Action or others in the space so that when the questions come up, when the, when the conversation does happen, that you're there and you're ready, you're sharp, you're ready to go. But d d don't be like pestering people, but what's going to happen is Bitcoin is going to go up. This always happens. All the haters, all the doubters, when Bitcoin goes up, then they're going to ask questions and you're going to be ready because you've been studying and being researching and also have access to great tools. We have some tools on our website. You're welcome to share them. Um, there are many other great tools out there, better than ours is even, even as well, where I wouldn't say that's our best feature, but we definitely do have some resources. And we are also, if you meet a lawmaker who reaches out to you and they want to learn more about the technology, we are more than happy to do the education for you, given that that's sort of our specialty. Really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, we have the end routine also, the last one where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. It's an interesting one, especially for you. Uh, assuming we all live within a Bitcoin standard already and you have achieved financial freedom, how would you choose to spend your time? Oh, assuming we achieve financial freedom and we're in a Bitcoin standard, how would I choose to use my time? I mean, I listen, I, I, I don't think I would change too much. I mean, I'm... I've been doing Bitcoin for seven years. I don't see myself doing anything different going into the future. You know, there may be some different ways that I approach the technology, but I couldn't be doing anything different. I wouldn't do anything different. I'm very happy with where I am, with what I'm doing. Um, it's been an honor to advocate for Bitcoin and to secure so many great wins for the technology in such a short period of time. And, uh, you know, we're on the edge of the frontier. So wh why, why would I want to be doing anything else with my time? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dennis, for being on. Before I let you go, where can people find you, the website of uh, what you're doing? Yeah, you can go to satoshiaction.io. And then if you want to reach out to us, you can email me or any of my team. You just use our first name, put satoshiaction.io in the email. Also, uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, we've got our Satoshi Act Fund handle. We've also got my handle, which is Dennis underscore Porter underscore. Or you can just put Dennis Porter at the top on Twitter. I'll, I'll probably show up. Um, and I tend to read most of my DMs. So if you reach out, you'll likely get a response unless of course it's not worth responding to, but, uh, any good faith effort I try to respond to. Absolutely. Really cool. I go, I feel like the not good faith one are usually bots. <laughs> really yes. cool. Thank you so much for your time, Dennis. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.